afternoon. It's the 31st of December 2016, so I'm recording this on New Year's Eve. And today we're here to do podcast number six, which is titled Hermetic Kabbalah, part one, part Sufim theory. So there are going to be a series of podcasts on the subject of Kabbalah and its relationship to alchemy and to Hermetism. So this first podcast on the subject of Kabbalah is going to explain what part Sufim theory is and give you the foundation um, knowledge of that. So it's taken me a little bit longer than I expected to get this podcast out because uh, I've got a few bits of new software that I've been mucking with and uh, it's taken me a few days, it's over Christmas as well, Christmas things going on, to sort out exactly how I'm going to present this kind of uh, uh, instruction because there are a bunch of diagrams and things so it's taken a bit of mucking around to get Going. But hopefully now we have a system which I can rely on and which hopefully will be interesting and informative. So let's begin by discussing first kind of what Kabbalah is and where it came from. It's common to for uh, modern Kabbalists to think of Kabbalah as being a Hebrew thing. In fact, Kabbalah is often referred to as Hebrew Kabbalah. Um, but today, in the modern world, there are sort of two versions of Kabbalah, two main versions. One is Orthodox Kabbalah, which refers to traditional Hebrew Judaic teachings about Kabbalah. And the other is Hermetic Kabbalah, which is the modern Western Hermetic world's take on Orthodox Kabbalah. He, the Hermetic Kabbalah began to be developed when early fathers of the Christian church took the Hebrew Kabbalah and started to Christianize it. And so for quite a long time, some hundreds of years, we had uh, a version of the Hebrew Kabbalah called the Christian Kabbalah. And it was an attempt kind of by esoteric Christians to uh, justify Christianity by saying that Hebrew Kabbalah actually encoded in its message uh, the fact that Christianity was going to come about in the end. Um, then eventually, uh, much closer to our own period in time, Hermetic Kabbalah started to evolve. And this was an attempt at basically trying to strip away all the garbage of the old Christian and Hebrew Kabbalahs and get back to the root of the message. And the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn has probably done more than anybody else at establishing the kind of ground rules for what the Hermetic Kabbalah should be. So my personal view of Hermetic Kabbalah has a lot to do with what the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn said about Kabbalah. But first let's look at the Hebrew side of the history. Uh, as I said, a lot of uh, modern occultists, like modern Kabbalists, consider Kabbalah to be a Hebrew thing. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Judaism itself said that its religion, and therefore, by implication, its esoteric teaching, came from a dude by the name of Abraham, what they, who they called Abraham. And uh, Judaic legend says that Abraham was a priest among the Sumerians, that he was a Sumerian priest, so he wasn't Hebrew, he wasn't part of Judaic culture, he was a Sumerian. And uh, Judaism also says that since their religion and their esoteric tradition came from Abraham, 
then we have to understand that Kabbalah, which is the center of Judaic theology and esoteric culture, actually was Sumerian to begin with. With if the legend is true that Abra, if there, that there was some kind of a guy in the past uh, who was like Abraham. <coughs> so, uh, anyone familiar with biblical mythology, legend, history, whatever you want to call it, will be aware that the Jews at one point in history were in captivity in Babylon, which is just Babylon and Sumeria are virtually synonymous. <clears throat> we can get nitpicky about it, but they're basically the same thing. And that eventually the Jews escaped from Babylonian captivity and uh, went back to um, Jerusalem in order to build the second temple. So Jews spent a lot of time involved in Sumerian Babylonian culture. And we know then from the Abraham legend and from the captivity, the diaspora, that uh, the esoteric tradition inside of um, Judaism was heavily influenced by the Sumerian esoteric tradition. So uh, the original Kambala that the Jews developed, what I refer to as the proto Kabbalah probably originated with the Sumerians. Then we know historically that the Egyptians adopted the same system, or they learnt it at the same time that the Sumerians did. Later in history, some centuries later, the second guy who was the biggest influence on Hebrew and Judaic culture was Moses. And um, we know that Moses was found as a baby by the Egyptian royal family and brought up at, as royalty, as a member of the royal family. That means he was trained as an Egyptian initiate. That was standard behavior. If you were a member of the royal family, you were trained by the priesthood because the royal family were part of the esoteric culture of Egypt. <clears throat> so Moses was probably uh, possibly an Egyptian himself, but he certainly was culturally identified with the Egyptians and he was trained as an Egyptian initiate. So when he started influencing the Hebrews and they all took off into the wilderness for 40 years, the esoteric influence that he had on Judaism came from the Egyptians. So we have two important f focus points for esoteric teaching in Judaism and they both came from what we assume is a Kabbalah that was similar for both the Sumerians and the Egyptians. The Hebrews picked it up and then they ran with it and they developed it along their own lines. So when we look back today as Western Hermetists at Orthodox Hebrew Kabbalah, what we're looking at is their version of a much older system. And um, we can begin, if we are fortunate, to strip back the garbage that has been dumped on top of Kabbalah for four and a half thousand years and start to consider what the root of Kabbalah might really have actually been. So this is the first concept to grasp about what Kabbalah is. It is Proto-Kabbalah, which means pre-Judaic. It is Orthodox Kabbalah, which means the traditional and conventional Judaic view of Kabbalah. And today for Western occultists, it is Hermetic Kabbalah. And while I'm going to refer to pieces of Orthodox Kabbalah as a reference frame, my move is increasingly towards Hermetic Kabbalah which was developed by the Golden Dawn primarily, and it is moving in a direction of kind to sh strip off the Judaism. Uh, so there are kind of two source works, two books, traditional pieces of literature, which are considered most important when studying Kabbalah. There are more than two, but there are two primary ones. 
and they are the Sefer Yedzira, or the Book of Formation, which is considered to be the oldest text on Kabbalah, and legend says that Abraham himself wrote it and handed it over to the Hebrews. And the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of Splendor, which was produced sometime probably between uh, the beginning of the Christian era and sort of around the medieval period sometime, the 13, 1400s, 1500s. The Sefer Yitzhara kind of, the first, the oldest book, kind of laid down the basic rules for what Kabbalah is and established the kind of rules, the basic rules for a diagram which is called the Tree of Life, a geometric diagram, which is the center of Kabbalistic teaching. It's the thing that you kind of use when you're explaining to somebody what Kabbalah is about. And we'll look at the Tree of Life for anybody who doesn't, isn't familiar with that shortly. Uh, then later in history, let's say in the early medieval period, we have a bunch of Kabbalists popping up who did a number of things that were important that created a situation that developed into what today we recognize as conventional Orthodox Kabbalah. The first um, thing that happened was that um, a particular guy, and we're not, I'm not going to go into detail about him yet because that's a whole nother story, but he gathered together oral traditions and written information about what Kabbalah was teaching from various sources. So at the stage when he did that, Kabbalism was in a bit of a mess. There were a lot of people with a lot of ideas about what Kabbalah was, and um, he wanted to gather it all together, sift through it all, and kind of to put together a standardized version of what Kabbalah was. Now we have to understand that the word Kabbalah itself means that which is transmitted or that which is passed on and western hermetists often translate the word kabbalah to mean the oral tradition now the thing is it actually wasn't oral for as long as a lot of people like to believe it was a lot of it was actually written down but the way of decoding the writings was largely an oral tradition this guy in the Middle Ages, Ish, who decided to gather all the information about Kabbalah together that he could find and put it all into one standardized publication, that book was then called the Zohar and it's an enormous piece of writing. It's thousands of pages long because there was a lot of information to gather together. But essentially, the Zohar is a commentary on the first five books of the Old Testament. So at that time the oral tradition and the underground secret tradition that he was gathering together to publish as a book <coughs> was largely a cluster of discussions and commentaries about the true meaning of the Old Testament. So we have to understand that the guys that originally wrote the Bible were all Kabbalists. They were like occultists and they're like, we're going to write down all this esoteric information, but we're going to write it in such a way that you could present it to non-initiates and give them a kind of superficial version of the story. And that's called the body of the law, the Torah, the body of the Torah. And there is also a soul of the Torah and a spirit of the Torah. But the most important other side of it was that below the, underneath, behind the uh, superficial story was Kab encoded Kabbalistic information. Because those guys were Kabbalists and primarily they wanted to pass on Kabbalistic knowledge. So the Zohar was a commentary on the Old Testament which explained what the secrets were inside of the Bible, behind the public story. Um, so while there's a lot of debate today about what the Bible means and people taking it literally and that, the fact is Kabbalists have no argument about what it's about. And there are, there are massive books that have been written, historically written, by the guys who inherited 
Kabbalistic tradition from the guys who wrote the Bible in the first place, um, explaining what the real meaning of the Bible is. So it's not a secret or a mystery, and at least it hasn't been for probably 1,500 years, at least, as far as the public are concerned. So the Zohar. The uh, Sefer Yitzhara, the Book of Formation, the Sefer HaZohar, the Book of Splendor, the two important source works. And in the modern Hermetic Kabbalistic tradition, two guys wrote commentaries on the important chunks of the Zohar, because it's a huge um, body of writing. So they've gone through all that stuff and they've sifted out the best stuff, which is most relevant to modern Western Hermetic tradition. The first of those two guys who did that in modern times was Samuel McGregor Mathers, the, one of the guys who founded the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He wrote a book called Kabbalah Unveiled, which is a commentary on important parts of the Zohar. Now he picked the pieces he did and he picked that book because he saw it as being most relevant to the Western Hermetic tradition. Then, around the same time as him, another guy, Arthur Edward Waite, who was a close friend of McGregor Mathers, he wrote his own version of Kabbalah Unveiled, which was called the Holy Kabbalah. And he basically did the same thing. It's a commentary on important parts of the Zohar. So, these two books, Kabbalah Unveiled by McGregor Mathers and The Holy Kabbalah by A.E. Waite are absolutely necessary reading for anybody in the West who wants to be serious about their approach to Kabbalah. Now, they aren't easy reading. The subject matter is deep and serious, largely because it's extracted from a tradition which could be more than four and a half thousand years old. And um, it represents the convergence of many streams of Kabbalistic teaching that all came together. The next thing that happened after the Zohar was published was that um, a number of Kabbalistic teachers in Spain during the medieval period decided that Kabbalah needed to be updated, that it needed a better commentary and teaching about what it meant. And so these teachers developed a bunch of schools because they gathered around them a lot of pupils, which today are recognized as the main streams of Orthodox Kabbalistic teaching. So uh, Orthodox Kabbalah is largely something that was developed during medieval times. And because there's not much record about what happened before the attempts at standardizing things and making them clearer, because there's not much of a record dating back be before that period, medieval period, academics largely say, oh, Kabbalah probably didn't exist long before medieval time. Well, any occultist knows that um, because occultism is largely, for most of its history, been secret and an oral tradition, that there won't be records for a lot of things. And even if there were at some point, they've been lost or destroyed deliberately. So the fact that there are no written records is no way of judging whether or not there was an older tradition or how old it was. So uh, then the next thing is, of course, the big change in Kabbalah for Westerners was the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. So today, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, give a presentation on the subject of uh, Partsutham theory, a number of diagrams that will explain to you how it all works and how it came together. So now let's talk about what Partsutham theory is and why it's important. So looking at the oldest instruction that we have about Kabbalah, which is from the Sefer Yitzira, the Book of Formation, and the Sefer HaZohar, the Book of Splendor, there is a common theory in the Zohar, there's a common thread of 
theory in the Zohar, which is very obvious to anybody who reads that text unbiasedly, that the Zohar has a lot of narrative in it, which is of the nature of a discussion about human psychology, in particular esoteric psychology, in other words the kind of occult side of what's going on inside the mind. Now modern Hermetic Kabbalists learned the basic system for this, the names and the natures of the Partsufim for example, but they really don't know what it all means or why it's part of Kabbalah or what it's used. So they pretty much ignore that side of Kabbalah and they focus on other facets of Kabbalah that are more directly related to what we recognize today as typical Western magical tradition. So um, one of the big problems about the psychology side of Kabbalah, which is all through the, the oldest Kabbalistic teachings, is that a lot of people don't understand it. Some people claim to understand it, but it is very difficult to understand unless you have a background in psychology which is where I came into the story. So, many well-studied modern Western occultists are familiar with the connection that Carl Jung, the, the, the father of modern psychology, one of the fathers of modern psychology, the connection that he has with the esoteric tradition. Because while he was trying to develop one of the first modern views of what psychology was and design a system of psychotherapy that would be effective for modern times, one of the things that he did was he studied alchemy because he recognized in it something of value where human psychology was concerned. While he was studying alchemy, he also came into contact with Kabbalah. And so we find today, when we look at Carl Jung's system for psychology, that it contains a number of alchemical and Kabbalistic concepts. So this is the first really important thing to understand about Partsufim theory. That it wasn't just something a bunch of weird occultists made up four and a half thousand years ago. That today, in modern society, a system of psychology is being worked that was discovered or rediscovered by one of the modern fathers of psychology that contains alchemy and Kabbalah, which is a bit of a strange thing when you think about it. What Carl Jung did was he discovered when he started poking around inside people's heads, experimenting with psychology, delivering psychotherapy to patients, and developing the system of psychoanalysis that he's now famous for. He discovered that the old alchemists and the Kabbalists, that they knew about how the mind was structured and how it works. <clears throat> but not only that, they knew a lot about the secret esoteric side of the mind. So we find a couple of important key things that are um, predominant in Kabbalah and in alchemy <clears throat> that are also in Jungian psychology. And they are the idea of the anima and the animus that every man and every woman are, have actually both genders inside of them. And that men just have the male gender uh, more prominent and the female one more oppressed and women have the female one more prominent and the male side repressed. Now this anima animus thing comes from both Kabbalah and alchemy. Jung also recognized um, a system of archetypes of the human unconscious. In other words, prominent structures in the in the, in the mind um, and he called them the scenics or old man 
the old woman, the young male or the young boy or the young man and the maiden. They were the first four archetypes that he discovered in the mind and integrated into his system of psychology. He also recognised the shadow as the uh, focus of the dysfunctional side, dysfunctional side of the unconscious and what we today call, what I today prefer to call the higher genius. Now, Jung didn't talk a lot about the higher genius but we know today from writings of his that have been released in the last couple of decades that Jung was having a lot of experience with his own higher genius because of the way his psychoanalysis had affected him and also his students and his patients were going through the same thing. So we have a system where a modern psychologist who's very well respected and has what's considered to be a very spiritual form of psychology discovered inside the mind things that the Kabbalists had said were there and the alchemists. Now my part in the story is that when I first started studying human psychology I avoided reading much about it. Uh, I came to the subject first through um, hypnosis and hypnotherapy. I gained qualifications as a hypnotherapist in the uh, early 90s, early to mid 90s. And so I investigated the mind more or less in the same way that Freud and Jung did. They just dived in there and poked around and categorized the things that they discovered there and eventually found out that they were not the first people to do this, that there's actually ancient teachings that had done the same thing thousands of years ago. Uh, then while I was poking around, figuring all the stuff out for myself and trying to understand the structure and the way the mind worked I then got involved in alchemy and then through that in Kabbalah and I came to the same conclusion that Jung did that these things inside the mind that the structure of the mind and the way it behaves well, had already been known for thousands of years by alchemists and Kabbalists so I went down the same road that Jung did without even knowing that Jung had been there before me then I started reading on Jung, started discovering more about how he learned what he learned and what it was that he discovered and realised that I'd gone down the same road. Now there's an important conclusion to draw from this. If Jung could do that, he had nothing to go on basically except for what Freud had taught him. So he was kind of diving into the mind with an unbiased point of view with a scientific approach to psychoanalysis, trying to figure out the game of the mind, how it worked. If I can do the same thing, just an average guy basically who got his hands on a tool, hypnotherapy, which allows you to look in the mind and examine it, if both of us can come to the same conclusion, then we have to assume that it was possible thousands of years ago for other people to do the same thing. So we have to assume that occultists four and a half, five, six, whatever, thousand years ago had access to a similar kind of tool like hypnosis or Jung used active imagination to investigate the contents of the mind and categorize it. And then over many, many years they built up a body of knowledge about what they discovered and then eventually developed teachings around what they discovered. So this is this is one of the important premises that I work from. That this is ancient teaching. That these people already figured out the stuff. That we're just simply rediscovering it again today, after a period of time of it have been largely lost. That then after the long period of time that, th that the ancients had to play around with this stuff, that they learned that the mind actually has a purpose, that our awareness and our existence actually has a purpose, and that that purpose is to 
force us to learn certain things and able to put us in a situation where we can then enter into esoteric initiation and eventually attain a state of illumination, of spiritual emancipation. So they discovered there's a goal, a point in everything that's going on here. Think of it as like watching a pumpkin plant grow, for example. You put the seed in the ground, you water it, the ground is warm, there's sunlight, you see it sprout, uh, you see it grow, it develops into a fruit, and then you realize you can eat the fruit. It doesn't take long before you kind of figure out from fruit and vegetables, and if you like to think of it that way, animals and fish, that these things are growing for a reason, that, that they are food, and that all that process, the seed in the ground, the warmth, the water, the germination, the sunlight, development into a mature plant, the development of flowers and then fruit, that it's a system and that it has a purpose. Well, they discovered the same thing about the mind and they wrote all the stuff down and eventually that became the Hebrew Kabbalah and then eventually that became Hermetic Kabbalah. And so today we have uh, access to the basics of a tradition which is extremely old, where people have already figured out the game. And uh, the only problem that we have with all of this today is that it is in a very bad state of repair because it has been abused for centuries and centuries. Uh, religions being dumped on top of it, politics are being dumped on top of it, has been commercialized. Um, People have uh, exploited it and abused it, and people who have misunderstood it have dumped mistaken stuff in it, but the truth is still there to be dug out in the background. So let's now talk about the Partsufim specifically, so that we can understand what they are and where they came from. So, in order to uh, consider where the idea of the Partsufim came from, we need to turn to the Bible, the Old Testament, and uh, the book of Genesis, and the very first word in the book of Genesis. Which is the word Bereshit. Here we can see it spelled in the Hebrew language. Hebrew is written from right to left and down here we can see the English translation of each of these letters. B-R-A-S-H-I-T-H. -S Bereshit. And this word translates into English as in the beginning. So we all know, or we should know, that Genesis starts off with the sentence, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So this word Bereshit uh, is the word in the beginning. And we notice here that there are six letters in that word. And so we end up with a scheme that looks something like this. I've reversed the spelling so that we can see it more clearly in English. Six letters. Now, we have to remember that the men who originally wrote the books in the Bible were Kabbalists. They weren't just average Joes who decided to write a history or whatever. They were Kabbalists and the Hebrew language uh, was specifically designed to be able to use it as a form of enciphering information. A lot of the ancient languages were like this. 
and so when we read the Old Testament there are kind of two levels of information there. There are actually three levels. Tradition says there are three but for the moment so that we don't complicate things we, we need to understand that there are two levels. There's the outer version of the story which everybody reads when they look at the Bible and read it and uh, that's what we might call the literal um, understanding of, of the Bible and then there's the hidden meaning which is the Kabbalistic interpretation of the Bible. So uh, an example of how that Kabbalistic uh, meaning works can be seen when we take the word Bereshit and we divide it in two and we end up with two new words that are root words that make up that word Bereshit and they are bra sheet and these two words mean he created six so when we read the first word in Genesis Bereshit we can understand that there are two layers of information there the first layer says in the beginning and the second hidden layer says he created six and we can see that this makes a sentence and it's completely understandable rational sentence in the beginning he created six now the Kabbalists wanted this part of the story the divided part of the word he created six to remain hidden so it's information that was only passed on uh, between initiates and uh, that information tells us that in the beginning at the start of creation God created six facets um, to reality now these six facets to reality were required in order for the world we live in the reality we live in to be uh, perceivable so the first aspect of those six facets is three-dimensional space that's one dimension through here one dimension through here and one dimension through there back and forward left and right up and down and most people uh, who are aware of you know basic physics and navigation are aware that this can be pictured in the form of a cube and a cube has six faces but it has uh, three dimensions up down left right back forward and so we can picture that in a diagram like this and altogether we have six directions so in the beginning he created six the first part of that formula is that in order to live in and perceive physical reality he had to create three dimensional space now each of these dimensions has a form of consciousness or an aspect of mind related to it and we need this because we can't perceive um, these directions in three-dimensional space unless we have a form of consciousness that is associated with these directions in space so we take the first three directions in space and we call them the higher functions and there are three forms of mind or awareness or consciousness associated with them and we, we have these little interesting little icons that we use to picture them just to give us an idea in our mind of what we're talking about this first row of labels along the top here are the Hebrew names or labels or descriptions for these three forms of consciousness then under here in the next row we have the English translations for those names and then on the bottom row we have um, what we might call the um, 
family attributions for those forms of consciousness because altogether these different states, these six different states of consciousness or mind make up like a family unit. We look at um, these forms of consciousness in this way because these forms of consciousness also give birth to or are the source of um, the basic arrangement of our social uh, structure. So the first Hebrew word is yakida, and that translates as unified mind. In the yakida, all aspects of mind come together into one state. They are all unified in the yakida. He is everything. He's the uh, sum total of the whole system. And the form of consciousness or the fam part of the family unit that we refer to him as, th this is a term I most commonly use, is the higher genius. He's the highest form of intellect or mind or awareness. So the next uh, part of the family unit we call here and his attribute is wisdom. Because he's the oldest form of the mind after the unified consciousness, he is wise. He has access to the full length of experience and time. So he is wise. And we call him the father mind. He's the father in the family unit, the oldest male member, the most mature male member. Next we have Nishama and her mental attribute is understanding because she's the next oldest mental function to the chia she contains and possesses understanding because she's been around long enough that she's seen enough she understands what is going on she has extracted understanding out of the human experience and we also refer to her as the mother mind so this is a unit this is a unified state of consciousness and when the state of consciousness divides it first divides into this binary pair here chia and nishama we call this uh, first group of mental functions, the higher functions of the human mind. Actually, let's put them at the top. Then we have the next three mental states or mental faculties or mental functions to uh, complete our uh, six aspects. Remember we had the six directions and these are the six forms of mind that are able to perceive and act through the six directions of space. So we have up here the mature masculine side of the mind, the mature pole, masculine pole of the mind, and here is his uh, opposite, the immature or um, freshly created or unevolved male state of the mind. The Hebrew name for him, the Kabbalistic term for him is Ruach. And he is the objective or thinking mind. The Ruach is the part of us that looks out into the exterior world, observes our environment, thinks about it, makes judgments about it, and then makes plans about it. The purpose of the Ruach or thinking mind is to create plans about our environment and our life in order for us to be able to survive in life. That's why he's there. He thinks about things and comes up with plans. 
in the family unit, he is the son. So he's the younger version of the father, the less experienced and more undeveloped version of the father. He also has the title of king, and his father is also known as the emperor. He is the king of the lower world and because uh, he gets this title because basically his thinking mind uh, we're all aware that when we're walking around in our daily life the thing in our mind that we are most often aware of is the thinking mind and we think of the thinking mind as being us our ability to think about the world to uh, function properly in the world and uh, we think of thinking as being the ruler of our uh, personality or our reality. That's why he's called the king. His partner, the other half of his binary, is Nafesh. And that translates in he from the Hebrew as uh, animal mind. In modern uh, psychological terminology, she is the unconscious mind. So these two together make up a binary pair, just like these two. And these two are the younger version, the less evolved version of these two. She's the daughter and the queen to his king. The third aspect of this lower uh, triad is Nakash. And in Hebrew, the word nakash translates as serpent. But in the Hermetic Kabbalah, we most often refer to him as the dragon. And um, in uh, Hermetic uh, mythology, he is most often referred to as the red dragon. And in Kabbalistic mythology, he is sometimes referred to as the seven-headed dragon. So these three together, these three aspects of mind together, are what we call the lower functions. Nakash also uh, has the attribute which we might call the divider or the separator. He is the function of mind that keeps these binary pairs separated, divided from each other. He's the part of our mind that forces us to see reality as a duality, as a dichotomy. Uh, sun and moon, day and night, man and woman, up and down, left and right back and forward, all of these dual aspects of life, our binary way of thinking about things that um, make up this world that we live in, that entire binary function is uh, sustained, maintained by the Nakash. His label, one of the important labels for him in Hebrew Kabbalah is the dual contending forces. So these are the six primary partsufim, the six primary persona, the six primary archetypes of the human consciousness and we find in traditional and orthodox Kabbalah a whole bunch of references to these six uh, intelligences is the term that I prefer to use and a lot of stories a lot of stories in the Old Testament are hidden references are like fairy tales or allegories or metaphors about the relationships between these various functions of mind, how they affect us internally, and also how they play out their conditions and their development in collective human behavior. 
So everything we are, everything that we have been, and everything that we potentially can be is summed up in these six intelligences, and that's why they're so important. So now we want to look at the partsutham, or the primary intelligences of the mind, in relation to the Kabbalah itself. And in order to do that, we need to begin some consideration about the Kabbalistic tree of life. So I'll quickly show you how we construct the tree of life diagram. We start off with a large circle divided equally into four sections, and we mark the center of that circle exactly. And then we make three more copies of that circle and we line them up in this way. The top line of the second circle rests over the center of the first circle and the edges on both sides are lined up exactly and we want four of these. These are referred to as the great circles and also the four worlds of the Kabbalah. The idea being that physical reality or creation is composed of four conditions or states or worlds. Then we make another circle which is roughly about half the distance of the radius roughly. Inside, uh, tradition says that inside these four worlds, God um, extruded or emanated ten states of being. And these are represented by these dark, small circles. In Hebrew nomenclature, they are referred to as Sephiroth, and a very uh, direct translation into English is spheres, the ten spheres or the ten emanations of God make up the tree of life. So we can see where these are placed. Now the tree of life is basically a tool that was designed for teaching Kabbalah. When Kabbalists discussed ideas about the nature of the universe, they used the tree of life as a kind of a reference point and also a way of uh, listing and comparing uh, different concepts and ideas in Kabbalah. So it's sort of a, a reference frame. Now these ten spheres are joined together by what we refer to as the 22 paths of the tree of life. Along with the spheres, this gives us 32 attributes or 32 facets to the tree of life. Ten spheres, twenty-two paths. And the paths represent the relationship between the spheres. So for example this little path here 
represents the relationship between the things that this sphere stands for and the things that this sphere stands for. So together, the 22 paths and the 10 spheres are supposed to be a basic road map or blueprint or plan of the primary forces that lay behind physical manifestation. And so, of course, what this means is that uh, the six-part sufim have a relationship with the tree of life because they are forces which lay behind physical manifestation. So let's now just reproduce that diagram of the tree with the paths slightly muted. So that we can go back and consider the roles of the partsufim on the tree without getting without allowing the paths to get in the way and confuse things so just make it a little bit more simple so here is the yakita which is the highest of the mental functions and the yakita belongs to that sphere there. He is the highest aspect of the human mind, the higher genius, the unified mind. His first emanation is the father mind, the chia or kia, who represents wisdom and divine will. He represents divine will because partially because he's the first action that God made when he was creating the universe. And then we have the Nishama or understanding. These are, remember, the higher functions of the mind and they belong to what we refer to as the supernal triad. Now there's kind of a gap through here that we can see and this is what Kabbalists refer to as the abyss. The three higher functions are the eternal part of the mind. They do not die when the physical body and personality die. They continue and live on from lifetime to lifetime and they accumulate the essence of the experiences and lessons of every life in themselves. And it is this accumulated experience of many, many lifetimes which provides Nishama with understanding and Kia with wisdom and allows Yakida to accumulate all that we have been, all that we are, and all that we will be. Our next consideration are the lower functions of the mind. The Ruach, or the thinking mind, the Nefesh, or the unconscious, and the Nakash, the dragon. So, the thinking mind was also known as the son of Kia and Nishama and the king of the lower world is attributed to 
primarily to the central sphere in the tree here but his feet rest in this sphere here and his upper functions his higher functions the peak of his skills and ability rest in this sphere here his partner the nefesh rests over these two lower spheres her foundation or her feet are in the lowest sphere on the tree which represents the physical world and her highest abilities her highest functions are in this sphere here which is attributed to the moon she is the unconscious mind and she represents a the connection and combination of the unconscious and the physical world because there's a relationship between those two things Ruach extends out of the unconscious into the conscious world which is represented by the sphere and by the Sun which provides light in the world and therefore allows us to see and experience the world which is his function he looks out onto the world and he sees it and experiences it and Nakash and the Nakash the serpent belongs to the physical world and below the physical world down here that's not going to fit on my diagram so we'll just stick him there So this section of the tree down here uh, is what we refer to as the lower functions from the abyss here all the way down to the underworld which is the serpent. So this is the basic diagram for how the partsufim are overlaid on the tree of life diagram. This is a diagrammatic and symbolic representation of the structure of the mind and we can learn from this diagram and the relationships between each part of the mind how the mind functions and how it develops. We see all these things discussed in a great deal of detail in classic orthodox Kabbalistic texts especially in the Zohar and the gold the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was one of the first modern esoteric fraternities to um, define and standardize uh, this view of the tree of life with the parts Sufim represented on it and uh, to discuss this system uh, from the perspective of human psychology but even though they did us a great service the Golden Dawn by um, standardizing and defining the system uh, more carefully than it had been in the past many people who study the Golden Dawn uh, system of Hermetism neglect the side of Kabbalah because they don't really understand what it means or what its purpose what the purpose for studying it is and the purpose is directly related to initiation by understanding the relationships between these parts Sufim uh, we can uh, come to understand how the mechanism of initiation works uh, what state we are in as human beings and where uh, that state that we are presently in is developing towards this is one of the things which I'm going to be uh, dealing with in the coming podcast we're going to talk about all of this in a lot more detail
So now that we've had a look at the Tree of Life diagram and how the and the most productive way of overlaying the symbolism of the part Sufim on the tree, let's now have a look at a slightly easier way of representing that system. So again, here are the higher functions, and there are three of them. So we can just simply reproduce them in the form of a triad. And here are the lower functions and the three of them. So this simplifies the whole system down and makes it just a little bit easier to picture in our mind um, by removing the complications that are involved in the tree of life diagram. Now each of these uh, parts of them, or intelligences as members of a family group also have what we might refer to as elemental attributes. The higher genius is what alchemists refer to as the quintessence or what I refer to as the Q state of the mind and matter. The fifth element or the quintessence is a combination of the other four elements earth, water, air and fire. The four elements combined into one new condition which is then called the fifth element and this is the symbol for the fifth element and that belongs on there. The father function of the mind is the element of fire which is symbolized by the upward pointing triangle which we color red. The mother function is traditionally symbolized by the downward pointing triangle which we color blue. The sun or ruach is an upward pointing triangle with a line through it and the daughter or nefesh is a downward pointing triangle with a line through it. So this is fire, water, air and earth. And then we have a symbol for what alchemists refer to as the terra damnata or the corrupt earth. So we can see uh, more clearly the higher functions as a triad, the lower functions as a triad. We can see how they relate to the alchemical elements and here this dashed line through the middle tells us that the higher triad of the higher functions of the mind is connected to the lower triad uh, through the thinking mind and understanding the nishama. She's the lowest function of the higher mind. So she's closest to the physical universe. He's the highest function of the lower mind. So he's the closest connection to the upper level and the abyss of course goes through the center here. So this diagram can help us when we're discussing the subject of the parts of their relationships to each other and how they are arranged together uh, to more easily picture those relationships in our mind without having to deal with the complications of the tree of life diagram always. And here on the left of the page we can see that 
those two triads are interlaced together and the whole thing forms a functioning living system.